coming up. And one day she comes over to dinner and I'm just joking with her. And I said, hey, you know that house is haunted, right? And she goes, oh, that lady on the stairs? Bro. Exactly. When she said that, it changed everything for me. Welcome to Unholy Vibes. I'm Alex, your host. Today we have a special guest, Lance, who happens to be my cousin. So Lance, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, just so happens. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, what you do, what you're about. So my name is Lance. What I do, I don't know what I do. We're just, we've been traveling people for the last almost three years. So we've done the RV life thing for a little bit. We've been over in Europe, Africa, headed back to Europe here pretty quick. And we just run social media, content creation and management and that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, we've definitely had some pretty weird, not weird, interesting experiences throughout our lives and our, and our travels. And some of them have been mutual with my wife and I, and some of them have been on my own. And so yeah, that's who I am, man. It's what I do. Yeah. We live the I, dream. Yeah. Lance inspires, inspires me to get my life together and travel the world. I'm a little jealous. It's really cool to see what you guys are doing. So just know that I, I think it's awesome. And I think a lot of people think it's awesome. So I'm happy you guys are enjoying it. You don't have to get your life months. together to do it. That's Fair. You have to do the opposite. You have to be fine with your life not being together at all. <laughs> you know what? Good advice. That's good to know. Good to know. I'm just banking on my kids. I'm banking on my kids that we do this for them. Then when they're old, we're old and have no money because we blew it all. Doing crazy things, they take care of us. They're like, we had a really fun 10, so 20 years, whatever, childhood, whatever. And then they put you in the really nice nursing home or something. Or, or like... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope not the nursing home. So far, I've got my, my 10-year-old and 11-year-old want to have houses in Hawaii and house us there, so on their pineapple Perf plantation. Perfect. I think with how much fun they're having. Have a good time. They'll probably take care of you. We can help. We can help. So you... Yeah, we do. We have some great adventures. Yeah, absolutely. So you'd reached out to me on Instagram. I was out there asking for more guests because I can never get enough. I... Uh, I'm insatiable. I, I want more spooky stories. I want people's crazy experiences. And a lot of people think, I had someone today actually say, I've never seen a ghost. And it's like, I don't need it to be ghost. It's not just a ghost. It can be anything. I'm not shying away from a good ghost story. So you reached out, you said you had some crazy stuff. Just from what you told me, I was like, okay, we got to get you on immediately. So here we are. So go ahead and dive right into it. And then once you're done, we'll discuss around it and analyze. Let's start with the UFO. My first UFO story, by the way, on the show. I have another one lined up, but you are the first. So thank you. <laughs> have you seen a UFO? I saw a Starlink one time and I was like, what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> I legit was I, no. was, I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Moab on some BLM land. And my wife and I yeah. saw Starlink and we were like, whoa. Never had seen it before. I did all not know. All the satellites lined up. Yep. All the green little dots flying in the sky. I was like, what do we just see? And my friends were like, oh, that's just, that's just Starlink. So no, the answer is no. I haven't. Yeah. Okay. So my grandparents, they lived out in the middle of nowhere on the outskirts of a very, very small town near the Bighorn Mountains. So it's actually a beautiful, beautiful place. And we were there like two summers ago and went and did a lot of things I did with my cousins as kids out there. Anyway, they were pretty secluded. So the main town was probably a town of, I would guess, maybe 3,000 people, and I'm probably being somewhat generous. And then to get to their house, you'd go out toward the mountains, and you'd get to where it was just sparse houses, and, and that's where they lived. And then my cousins lived directly across the street from them. So it's funny because I look at it now, and it's like my dream house, dude. They had well water. Like they were basically a solar panel away from being completely off grid, oh. and they sold it. And I'm like, gosh, dang it, that would have been. Although it gets super cold and windy. With kids, we would go out there every summer for about a week and we'd go out around Christmas time for about a week. And so one summer we're hanging out there and my uncle who lived across the street had taught me about like satellites, right? So I was like, I was probably between eight and 10 years old. But so I was focused on the sky and because they were so far out there, you didn't have light pollution. Mm. The sky was black. It was like Bryce Canyon, Moab black at night. Amazing just you could see everything right and so i was constantly just watching for satellites because i thought it was cool to see a star moving across the sky and one night it was august 
and it was meteor shower season. And it was supposed to be one of the biggest meteor showers that they'd ever have that year or whatever. I was really young. The specifics get blurry. But so we're like, all right, let's go camp outside, which we did a ton as kids. We would just roll out sleeping bags and lay and sleep under the stars. And we put up a tent, but it was just like a mosquito net, completely see-through. And so I remember like vividly, we're all just laying on the ground. We're looking up at the sky and I see this big object. It was pretty classic, like triangle lights, right? And it was uh, red lights and it, and it was moving across the sky like this, just really slow. Well, I looked up and as a kid, I, I said, hey, look at that satellite. That one's like really close. It's really low down. And my sister, she looks up and she goes, that's not a satellite. That's a UFO. And we go, what? And so we jump out of the tent and we run. And this thing is coming down at an angle. And then it stops and just goes, and it's gone. Like seconds. Like these mountains are hundreds of miles away. And the thing is just gone wow. instantly. And so we're freaking out, right? We're going nuts. Like, what did we just see? And, th and so we run in and we start telling my grandparents. And their response was, yeah, we see a lot of stuff like that out here. And so they start telling us one story after another of seeing these crafts. And I'm like, and you guys never thought to like record it or tell anyone or anything. And I mean, they were so nonchalant about it. It was kind of like made it like creepier. Like you just see that out there. And you no don't, big deal. No big care. deal, dude. It's just Wyoming stuff. No, exactly. So I carried this story with me forever. I've told it a hundred times. But then maybe at my grandma's funeral, our grandma's funeral, I recounted it with my siblings and they collaborate it, corroborate the story the exact same way. So I know that it wasn't just me being a kid and seeing something that I thought was something, but they're all like, no, I was like, that's exactly how I remember it. So it's pretty wild, man. It's just, and from there I, I stopped sleeping outside because we were pretty freaked out. You know, fire, it was about the same time that movie you remember, have you seen fire in the sky? Oh, uh, maybe is, is that the one where they're up and they're like loggers? And they, one of their guys gets Yeah, abducted. the guy gets abducted. Yeah. And then he shows up Happened, like a week I think later. Happened, in like the 70s. Uh-huh. Right. And he's never, ever changed his story. Like in the whole time, he's retold it a million times. And he, all the details are always exact. Um, the dude's pretty legit. But it was around the time that movie came out. And so I was like, I'm not sleeping outside again. I'm not ending up in some freaking alien spaceship. <laughs> like, it was like terrifying. But it was seriously so weird to just to hear my grandparents be like, yeah, we see stuff like that pretty often. That is wild. Okay. Cool. Imagine being so nonchalant about that. And I, I guess it's just often. They told us there was one that came up. My grandpa had a shop behind his house. And again, big property. He probably had 15 acres or something. And he was out working in his shop and a light came and it stopped. And three lights came off it, flew all over, reconnected to the one, gone. And so... Is it UFOs? Is there a government facility not too far away that's testing craft? But the the way that they move the propulsion, it's definitely nothing like what we know, what we yeah. understand physics to be. That is so, wild. Yeah, I never, dang, never heard anything from anyone about, about any of this. So that's really cool. That is wild. Yeah, I would never sleep outside again. I'm right there with you. I'd be like, no, thanks. It's, it's weird, though, because the feeling it gives you is strange, right? Because you know in your mind, the odds of getting abducted probably aren't too high or something happening, but it's just there's such an eeriness now about it. And then I think the other weird part to it, though, that's like more celestial is the meteor shower was crazy that night. Like we were watching shooting stars nonstop. Mm. And then all of a sudden this craft shows up. It's like, what? Are they connected? Are they not connected? I don't know, but it just seemed very odd all the timing. Yeah, it was just cover for them to come do some recon in Wyoming. Maybe. Why Wyoming of all See, places? See, but I don't though? think spaceships. Dude, you know what? That's always the question. I'm sure you've looked into Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Middle of, have you been there? Have you been where it is? No, I have not. It, I have some friends who, Dude, it is in the, they know the owner and they want to go up and camp on Skinwalker Ranch. And I'm like, I don't know about that. It's in the middle of nowhere, dude nowhere it's just surrounded by reservations and it's not remarkable in any way you go out there and it's like dude if you were out here 100 years ago all you're gonna do is die <laughs> there's not water that place is wild i've been obsessed with it for a pretty long time actually i but you just wonder 
I I probably will end up going just to try it out sometime. Give it a little, give it a little look, give it a little visit. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about the alien stuff. I'm more into the supernatural spooky things. But that's why I'm like, dude, give me alien stories. I want it because that's just a whole other avenue to explore. So, so it's skin and Skinwalker has it all. They've got, but that's what I was getting to is I, I actually don't think that UFOs are in space. I really don't. Well, there's two. You want to hear both my theories? Please. I mean, both of them are total made up by me, but <laughs> one of them is, and the one I probably would be more apt to believe is that things are more interdimensional, right? And there's vibrations and different universes are vibrating differently, but we're actually on the same exact plane. And beings have learned how to change their vibration so that they can see us and we can see them. And that would explain a lot of the movement and how it works and the fact that if they're organic creatures, they're not going to really survive that trip for the most part because we know that for whatever million light years away, there's nothing. And so if they're organic, there has to be a different way that they're traveling than actually crossing through time and distance, right? No, I like that. Second one is, and I think that that might go for kind of anything supernatural is that we're all on the same plane, but you can see what you can see. And yeah, it can change. And vibrations, like a big thing I look, I think about a lot and look into a lot is that everything vibrates and the way you see things is that they're vibrating. And so I don't know. Different ways. It could be completely wrong. You know? mm-hmm. But it's bizarre. Like you and I right now, we hear each other because we make vibrations that change sound waves. That's how you hear my voice, right? It's not that crazy to think that visual is no different, right? Yeah. And I, even to take it further, we hear and see each other because a bunch of wires are able to transmit data and then wirelessly throw it to my computer. And here we are. It's like, you never know. We're, yeah, you can dive into the whole advanced technology rabbit hole even, you know? Yeah. And so I think that's an option. The other possibility I I think of as far as if something's coming through space. Now, the other reason I think maybe not through space, because I feel like space might be monitored enough at this point that you would see it before it came into our atmosphere versus a lot of these ships just show up. Mm -hmm. Like they're just there and they're gone. I actually have a a family member who's a pilot who just saw a UFO, like just barely. Dude's legit too. He's he was a F-15 fighter pilot. Like he's not just some like random guy. And he's been a commercial pilot for years. And I asked him recently, I said, Have you ever seen anything weird? Have you ever seen UFO? He starts laughing. I said, What? He goes, I never had to like two days ago. <laughs> and he explained to it, and I don't know if you know the tic tac UFO story. Very similar. Mm-hmm. It looks like a tic tac in the sky, but it's just moving with propulsion systems that make no sense. And this guy knows propulsion. He said it moved, in his opinion, 15,000 feet in like milliseconds. It was just there and then boom, 15,000 feet further away. I mean, there's stuff out there in, in space and it's, it, anyway, my second theory is if things are visiting us from space, they're not organic. They're like drones, mm. like what we send to Mars or what we send somewhere else. And that's like a pretty, when you listen to the guy uh, from Fire in the Sky, I wish I could remember his name. He talks about the grays because that's what he saw were the grays, the typical big head, pointy chin, big eyes, gray skin. And he said when he ended up on the ship, they weren't like hostile or anything. They acted more like surprised that he was there. Like they had no intention on picking up a human. We're like, oh boy, we got this human on the ship. But they were so non-emotional. So he said he reached for something to grab and was trying to hit him and they just looked at him. And so it makes me think, and obviously there's no reproductive organs that are visible. And so it's like, are these just like a non-sentient technology? And then that way you can send them across time and space. They don't have to live. They don't have to have food. They don't have to have water. You can send and then you can explore and discover and see. And so, I don't know. That's the second theory. I don't know if it's true or not, obviously, but. I, I like to say that there's just a lot we don't know. There's so much more that we don't know than we do. So who's to say, who's to say any of it's wrong? We just don't know. We just don't know. So I I like fake in your experience. 
or we're in the matrix. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it could, be, <laughs> it could go any way. So yeah, but I'm open to hearing all sorts of theories because I find it fascinating. So yeah, I like it. A simulation theory is one that makes more sense to me than most. Oh, I don't like to think about it. Like, man, simulation theory, we ended up in like this hellscape with so many problems. Yeah, I've seen what people Not do. Not if their... you just stay plugged in, man. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I've seen what people do to their sins. <laughs> I, I'm scared. No, let's... their sins. <laughs> have you seen that meme that someone's like, when you have a baby, do you have to feed it and take care of it, or will it, or will it die? And their response was. It was like, OMG, I did not. I was freaking out till I realized this was a uh, a forum about Sims characters. Oh. <laughs> Everyone's like, yes, <laughs> you crazy. Person. And I read it the same. I was like, what? But people are, they, there's so much crazy freaking forums and people ask the weirdest questions. So I, you know, I don't question humanity anymore. I yeah, just And some people it. are just very dumb. Anyway. Yeah, that's my uh, UFO uh situation and fantastic and fantastic ufo stories man. okay so that's early on in your life that's early you were a youngster yeah i would have been really young it's funny because i thought there, i listened to some other supernatural podcasts right and i thought god it's weird that i just re haven't really had any of these experiences and then when you reached out i started going i actually had a few of these experiences and they're weird so the second one is uh is dying that one's really this one's really weird. So I had, when I first, first time I ever hung out with my in-laws, we went out to Lake Powell and ended up blowing my knee to like bits, like just shredded it and end up getting back up to Utah County and going in for surgery. The surgery goes fine. So then they put me in recovery and they hook me up to a morphine button. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking the nurse, cause I was pretty groggy and stuff coming out of anesthesia. And asked the nurse, I said, okay, what if I push this button too many times? She's like, well, it's, it's on a timer, so nothing will happen. It's only going to release a certain amount of morphine. And I don't know if you know this, but morphine and heroin are basically the exact same thing. Chemically, they're like barely different, and they only changed it enough so that they could sell it as a painkiller. So yeah. if you're getting morphine at a hospital, you're basically getting heroin. And... So I'm like, okay, cool. And, I, and through the night, my knee is just aching and I'm just hitting this button and nothing's changing. Like my knee is just absolutely just throbbing all night. And so the nurse comes in in the morning and she's like, oh, how is everything? I'm like, yeah, I'm in a lot of pain still. She's like, okay, we'll look into that. And at the time I had to do one of those things where you have to blow in it and keep a ball to a certain height. For a certain mm -hmm. amount of time to show that like your oxygen saturation is good and that all looked good and shows she's like hey like your oxygen saturation is good or your blood oxygen levels are good we're going to go ahead and take this machine off you and everything looks good and they put the iv like right here in my hand and she grabs it and she wiggles it and then walks out of the room and then i flatlined and i flatlined because the iv wasn't in right and so all that morphine from the night before, never got into my bloodstream. It was sitting right there Bro. at the uh, injection. Ooh. So once she pushed it, I get enough morphine to, I don't know, kill a person. I know that much. But then she'd also unhooked the machinery. So the machines don't start going off right away. So anyway, so I die and leave my body. And I'm in this hospital. And I'm up in like the corner of the hospital bed looking down at myself and going, what, what's happening? Like, why, why do I see myself? Right. And so the next thing I know, I'm in like this big open space and everything was really blurry, but there were like beings all very like the typical, like they're like in white colors. And I, and it was weird because I felt like I knew them, but I don't know who they were. Right. Mm -hmm. If you were to say, was it your great grandpa or your uncle? Now, at that time, too, I didn't really know that many people close to me who had passed. So I don't know. But it was like I knew him. And one of them walks up to me. He's like, oh, hey. And I'm like, why am I here? Like, I, what am I doing here? I'm not supposed to be here. And he goes, well, you died on your, on the operating table. But then I remembered, I was like, I didn't die on the operating table. Because I remember going into recovery. And then all of a sudden, boom, lights are flashing. Sirens are going off. They're like shaking me. I'm like half awake. My fiance at the time is in the corner, just bawling her eyes out. And yeah, they brought me back, dude. But I've not been the same since. 
it's a very sobering experience because you know you're immortal, right? We all know we're going to die, but we don't really think we're going to die. Does that make sense? And so once it happens, and I was like 24, I'm at the age where you literally think you're invincible. And yeah, I die, come back. And then my mom came in the room eventually, and I just like burst into tears. And like, I'm not a crier. Like I was grown up, like raised that you just don't cry. So I just didn't cry much. I just burst into tears, like uncontrollable sobbing. And it's, it, it's just a really sobering experience to realize it could have ended today or did end. And they use like the proxen or whatever it is to bring you back. So it is wild. But I think that might have put me a little closer to some other stuff too, like to seeing some other things. That is wild, dude. Yeah, not every 24 year old gets to go face to face with their mortality and accept the fact that he could die anytime. And I, not to take us off track or anything, but in the past couple of years, I haven't had any crazy experiences like that, but I think a lot about death and mortality. And it just is, it just is like, we're all going to die and it could happen anytime. Only certainty. Yeah. Yeah. We know for sure we're going to die eventually. And I think about that shit a lot and I try and people freak out. People are afraid of death, but I feel like once you get to a certain point, you're just like, you accept it. Maybe that's what I feel. I know it's going to happen. So there's no point in fearing it. Or maybe that's why people are like, these are the day live your best life. Cause you could die anytime. But I just think mortality is a very interesting thing to come face to face with, especially in that experience. So I can only imagine, I can't even imagine actually, but that's wild. That is very, very wild. It's weird. It really sobered me up. Just made me a little more careful drive a little slower and it wasn't a positive nor a negative experience it just like you said just was it was just i remember just being perplexed what, like almost and it almost made me think do i know when i'm supposed to die because i'm up there and i'm like saying i'm not supposed to be here yet and they're like and they didn't really whatever these entities were there wasn't really much of a response just that oh you died from your operation and i just remember thinking, like what the fuck are you talking about like i came out and got you know yeah. And uh, yeah, so that we figured out later is just a morphine overdose. And coming back, though, was not pleasant. Like, it was very jarring. It was very hard hitting. Like, holy crap, what just happened? You know? Do you think that, well, how long were you technically dead? Just like a few minutes, a few uh, seconds? A couple minutes. Okay. Like two, two and a half minutes. Okay. I don't think you can go much more and come back for most people. Right. And I don't know if you remember this or know this, but my younger brother, John, was dead for about three minutes when he was like seven years old. He drowned. I don't know if you, anyway, years, years, years I don't ago. know that I knew that. Yeah, literally. I, you know, as you say it, it sparks a memory, but I would have never remembered otherwise. It, it was almost 20 years ago. You know what I mean? It, yeah. But he being a child didn't, wasn't able to really articulate or remember much. It was just a very right. intense experience for all of us who were there. He did relay some stuff, but we won't get into that. But I wanted to ask, do you think when you did die and you were like seeing yourself, was it a comfortable experience? Does that make sense? Were you just like, oh, this is, I'm just here. You weren't uh, like. No, it was, it was kind of mundane to be honest. Just like I say, it just was what it was. Yeah, so in college, I actually studied uh, near-death experiences. And a lot of them are way more like in-depth. And they feel like love or they feel scared or someone embraces them. I didn't have any of that. It was just like a little bit mundane. Just, okay, this very, is it, I guess. Very you know, nonchalant like, kind of feel. Yeah, but that's how I am with life. I'm not this overly passionate, emotional person. Like mm. Things are what they are. And so that could be why too. I don't know. Or it could be, I wasn't gone long enough. I'm not, I'm really not sure. But like I say, coming back was just absolutely jarring though. Like when you're in this place, that's kind of calm. And then all of a sudden someone's shaking you and there are alarms going off and like people are like running. It's like a, a scene from ER. I think they call it a code blue and mm. it just gets crazy. And so you come back to just absolute chaos and, uh, yeah, man, I don't know. It really changed me though. 
it had a profound long-term impact on me. Can only, yeah. Again, I can only imagine. Wow. I've, I've heard of other people's near death experiences and where they're like same kind of thing where they're like above themselves, seeing themselves. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, oh, it's just your brain doing its thing. It's not really you. And other people are like, no, it's like an astral projection, different wavelength or something like that, right? Different mm -hmm. vibration. I, I don't know. I don't, I, who, we don't know. We don't know. There are some wild out of body experiences though, like say in that class, uh, where like a guy left his body, but he like, didn't leave like this plane. He stayed in the hospital, but was out of his body. Mm. And he went out and he was looking on this ledge, like six stories up, and there was like a shoe on it for some reason. And so when he came back, he told them about it and they went up and sure enough, there's this kid's shoe sitting on this ledge that there's no way this guy could have gotten to. We couldn't have seen it from outside or anything. So I, I think you definitely leave. The other theory that's interesting is like, are you pretty familiar with DMT or at least somewhat familiar with it? Not really. I've heard of it, but yeah, yeah. I'm not. It's really interesting because our bodies produce DMT constantly, but our bodies also produce a DMT inhibitor. So it stops it from doing anything. So your body's constantly producing this and your body's constantly stopping it. Really weird. People use it. I don't, I wouldn't call it a recreational drug. It's more of a spiritual experience tool, but when you die, that inhibitor stops and the DMT just floods your body. Oh, wow. So some people think it's just a DMT kind of trip. But I've had to talk to friends who have used DMT and they say, like, you do leave your body. It's not just, it's not just like a thought. It's like, you're gone. Like you definitely feel like you are not on this plane anymore. So it could be that too. It's just, it's so life altering though. Like it kind of killed my ego a lot too. Like when you no longer think you're invincible, it knocks your ego down a peg as well. Mm -hmm. So. I think I'd be too scared to try DMT if, I don't know if I would want to leave my body. That's kind of sketch. It's a wild one. We spent some time recently in the Amazon and they've been using it for probably thousands of years in medicine, but they use it in ayahuasca. That's mm. the active ingredient in ayahuasca ceremonies is DMT. And it's, I don't know, they've used it for a long time to try to connect with like ancestry and to try to like understand themselves and they grow ayahuasca everywhere. Like we were in Colombia and just growing looks like a vine it's growing everywhere so i don't know i i don't know of anybody dying from it so it's less dangerous than morphine at least <laughs> yeah yeah i'm sure do you think that that's this is totally like a weird left turn i'm about to take but do you think culture off, man. do you think culturally and because and you you're a good person to ask this since you do travel so much do you think that culturally, like the United States is just so turned off to like spiritual experiences like that, that that's why people are so skeptical because this is just, the U S is such a different kind of culture where it's like, meh, where if you go to other countries, they're like, yeah, dude, ayahuasca, DMT, let's do it. It's a common thing. They're more spiritual and connected with whatever. Do you think that's part of why the, the West and like the United States is the way it is? That's a really good question. We could take a far left turn here <laughs> if we get into it too deep. We'll be way over there. But I definitely think it takes you away from a consumerism mindset. Mm. Like when you understand that you are living life to have this experience and the experience isn't go to work, buy stuff, mm -hmm. throw it away, work more, buy more stuff. And when you fear more toward that spiritual side, that, that consumeristic side kind of goes away a lot actually. Yeah. And I could a hundred percent see repressing things that take away from consumerism because we're a consumer nation. I mean, we yeah. really are. Would I trade it for what I saw in some other countries? Probably wish there would be more of a hybrid option, an mm. option that's not so controlling with governments that are so controlling and so dishonest, I would love a place where you kind of have both. Because it was interesting in Colombia, because you find out that historically, even the medicine men and stuff would hoard ayahuasca and you couldn't use it unless you were 
like a high chief, high ranking in the government type Bummer. situation. So even that was like, they were almost using it to have control. But I definitely, from the people I talk to who've experienced a lot, like it's a huge ego killer too. And a lot of our Western society is built on ego. Why do you buy stuff? Is it for you or is it so someone can see you using it? Clout. Are you going to the Met Gala? It's exactly it. We live in a world where everybody wants to, and, and this is no different in other countries either, to be honest. In fact, in a lot of the poorer countries, it's worse because you'll see everyone wearing fake clout products, right? Mm -hmm. They're wearing the fake Gucci shirts. They're wearing the fake Louis Vuitton. They're wearing the fake, and it's just because they want to look like they have that money or they have that status or whatever. Um, but that's still like, saw that a lot actually in Africa. Egypt and, and Morocco, we saw that a lot. And I definitely think the further you get into spirituality, the further you leave from consumerism because you give up so much of your ego. And the less ego you have, you're not as useful a, of a cog in the, on the system. And yeah. So I definitely think that's repressed. I think there's immense benefits to, to earthborn psychedelics that have cl been classified as schedule one narcotics. Even though I got, I got killed with a prescription drug and most of my friends I grew up with that are dead from overdose died on prescription drugs, you know, mm -hmm. they were totally legal. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it, stuff that like expands your mind, makes you try to see the world a little bit differently. I, I don't know. We, we could even get into psychedelics forever if you let me go off, but. but we'll I, I see on. where you're going though. It's, I see where you're going though. It's like. <laughs> We could get into the whole con conspiracy theories and all that stuff. But anyway, I, I do see where you're going. It's like the things that would open our minds are being demonized. And mm -hmm. like in the consumer world. That would be why I think though they do it. It's just because spirituality and having a deep connection to something outside of consumerism takes you out of that, mm -hmm. that world. Yeah. And I brought this up before with a previous guest about faith or superstition, how other countries are way more superstitious and have faith in things. So you're saying like, when you feed those ideas, they grow, they become like, you're, you're, they manifest. Yeah. 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 And I think superstition is just the other side of the coin of faith. You know what I mean? Where if you're looking at it from like a Christian perspective, faith precedes miracles. Well, what is superstition? Just like a really intense faith in like some specific thing. And then you see things happen and I can cut this out, but I use the story of the evil eye and like how in some Latin cultures you take an egg and you rub it all over someone and when you crack it open, it'll have blood and it'll be black. And I've heard multiple stories about this where it's like, oh yeah, across all these different places and different, like these Latin cultures, this works for them. And if I was sick or possessed or whatever, I could rub an egg on myself and I don't think it would work just because that's not ingrained in me. Despite the What's fact the, that uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day though, you're just talking about the placebo effect, but it, and that's the thing, the placebo effect works sometimes. I think it's the most interesting part about drug trials is not if the drug works or not, but the fact that people are healing themselves because they think they're taking a drug that will work. There's That's power, the craziest part of drugs to me. There's power and belief, no matter what For that sure. belief is in. And that's a whole other rabbit hole we could dive into. But I just think it's interesting, the relation of that power and belief, placebo, superstition, and then different medicinal things and psychedelics and how different cultures are more open to using them on a more reg regular basis, as opposed to other places that are more like corporatized and consumer based and all of that. So it's just an interesting correlation. Doesn't necessarily mean it's right or true, but I like looking yeah, at No, it. when you get digging into it. So like we did a walking tour through the rainforest at night and we had a guy that was training to be a shaman. Ooh. And yeah, they believe that you be, take the form of a jaguar, for example, or you actually become a jaguar, like while you're using this ayahuasca and you go and you do, I don't know, whatever. But like this kid was training to become like an owl because owls are healers. And so like, I full on believe that he believes he will take the form of an owl and go and 
I don't know, do owl stuff. I, I don't I don't know like <laughs> Okay, you're going to do it and then what? I don't know. But he definitely believed that that's where he was headed. And medicine men before him, shamans before him, had told him they'd done it. So I don't, I mean, who's to like, say, I don't think, I think we definitely don't understand. I'm not going to tell him he's wrong. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, who are we to tell him he's wrong? <laughs> and when you look at the stories of skinwalkers. Yeah. I am fascinated by skinwalker stuff. It's terrifying. Can be. But I have no real knowledge. I just have some stories, right? Obviously, we, you know, just very base level. But it sounds similar. It's like, who's to say that they're not doing that? I've never seen it. Doesn't mean it's not true just because I can't see it. Oh, there's a lot of things I've, like, that UFO, I can't explain it. It's happened, but I can't explain it. The biggest superstition we actually ran into by far, the most superstitious place we've been is Romania. Really? The Transylvania area. Oh, oh they're cool. so superstitious. They're so like, we went to, I've actually been to Dracula's castle, but they believe in fairies and they believe in ghosts. And they believe that if a cat walks past a fresh grave, the spirit goes into the cat and it just goes on and on and on. Or there's some tradition. My wife remembers them better than me, but if you didn't get all your chores done, a being would come in your house and mess everything up, turn all your furniture upside down or something like. And some of them sound like they were to like trick kids to do their jobs. Yeah. But a lot of them, these full grown adults still believe in practice. You can't like, there's something like if you move into a new house, you have to exit out a different door than you came in or something can come in behind you and won't get out. Or maybe you have to exit out the same door you walked in. I can't remember, but they were superstitious, man. The Transylvania area, it's like easy to see where all of these mm. Dracula ideas and stuff came from because they're into it. Werewolves, all of it. That is wild. That is wild. I would love to study and learn more about different superstitions and different cultures because everyone's got their thing, right? Like every culture's got their thing that is their major. You know, Polynesians are very superstitious, the ones I know. Really? The Polynesian friends. So I had this kid in my mission from Tahiti. And there were actually two of them. One of them was from this little tiny island north of Tahiti. And the one that I knew well was from Tahiti. And the kid from the north ended up getting really sick. And my friend from Tahiti thought he got sick because he got cold, temperature cold. Mm. And so he would not take his jacket off ever. Dude, when I was there, I was in France. They were having one of the worst heat waves they've ever had. 10,000 people in senior care centers died from heat stroke because they don't have air conditioning in their places. That's how hot it was. I mean, every day you were just like pouring sweat. This kid wouldn't take his coat off. Like I remember like very specifically, you were sitting with some people in their house and he's just got sweat pouring down his face. Oh no. They're like, do you want to take your coat off? He's like, no, I'm good. Because he was so worried he would get super sick and get sent home. Oh no. If, uh, if he did, and so, and there were a lot of other things like that, but just very, very superstitious. Like, bro, you're going to get sick well. and, and get sent home because of extreme dehydration and heat stroke. <laughs> Chill. Damn, bro. I'm telling you, it was wild. Because he was a big dude, and he's yeah. just sitting there just pouring, just sweat pouring. I remember the lady looking at him just, just perplexed, like, what's this dude doing? Take your coat yeah. off. Should we get to the ghost story? Yeah, yeah. Let's get back onto the spooky lane. It's a good segue from talking about superstition and stuff because prior to this experience, I 100% was convinced ghosts were not real, like didn't exist, period. And it's because I watched really? all those stupid ghost hunter shows. Yeah, well, they were so dumb. It's like they never found anything. They would play like, did you hear that? He said, John, like he didn't say anything. Like literally that was just static. Like this is so dumb. They've never seen anything. Nothing's ever been caught. There's no way they're putting in this much effort and nothing's coming out of it. Ghosts aren't real. Like I was done with it. So anyway, so we sell our house and we we're building a new house. So we moved into this rental. Nice little house. No big deal. Nothing strange about it. Nothing significant. And the way the house was set up is it's like it was the garage went down underneath the house. And so when you walked in, you'd walk upstairs into the kitchen okay. or you could come through the front door. Only two ways to get in. And so the way the kitchen was set up was like a galley kitchen. So to get to my room, you'd walk toward the stairs, you would turn left, and then you'd turn right down the hallway, and that's where the bedrooms were. And so one day, very, like I say, just a completely innocuous day, nothing's going on. I'm walking past the stairs. I see my wife walking up the stairs, turn, 
I go back into our bedroom and then my wife's standing in the bathroom getting ready. And she looks at me and she's like, what? Like, what's, what's wrong? And I was like, I swear I just saw you walking up the stairs. He's like, I've been in here for 30 minutes. So I'm like, okay, that was really weird. Very strange experience, whatever. No big deal. We move out of the house and we help my cousin move into the house because she needed a place and we knew the landlord. And so we got her set up in this house. And one day she comes over to dinner and I'm just joking with her. And I said, hey, you know, that house is haunted, right? And she goes, oh, that lady on the stairs? Bro. Exactly. That's exact. I feel it even now. I was like, what? And she goes, and she's pretty in touch. In fact, if she ever wanted to meet, to talk to you, she's had a lot of experiences. Please. But when she said that, it changed everything for me. It went from just being, oh, I just saw something. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, yeah, I see her a lot. And she's, uh, she still lives in that house actually. And so she's had several experiences there. And eventually she said they started becoming a little bit more like scary. Oh, and basically told her, you need to leave the house now. Like you're the, done. This isn't your house anymore. The this ghost is my house. told her that. No, my cousin told the ghost. Oh, was like, I'm you like, need to leave. Okay. 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 No, 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 that'd be wild. No, she's still there. And so there was also in that house down in the basement, the laundry room was in like a dark, like unfinished underneath the stairs kind of room. And my wife never liked going down there. She said the vibe that always felt like there was something there that didn't want you to be there. And so I think since my cousin did like a clearing, uh, she did like a cleansing. She hasn't really had any other stuff go on, but you could feel it. Like the vibe downstairs was weird. And we didn't go in the basement very much because it was just basically storage for us. But when you would go down, there was a thing where like you'd run up the stairs as fast as you could because you felt like someone was following you and, up, right? And basements are scary as hell. It's creepy. They are scary. It's just breeding it ground for creepy, spooky shit. It, puts you under, it, it does. It puts you underground, right? And it like traps. But So the story goes a little bit further, but I, I don't know. I'll tell you what happened. So then I end up working in Kaysville at this boat dealership. And I start, this lady starts doing some secretary work for us. Well, it turns out she grew up in that neighborhood and her parents have lived there for like a hundred years. Like nobody leaves this neighborhood apparently. And so she did some digging and the same lady lived in that house forever. Like it was like a 30, 40 years in the house. And check this out. Her name was Mary McBride. And I was like, that's the most ghost name I've ever heard. If I made up a ghost, I would name her Mary McBride. And that's this lady's name. And she lived there for her whole life. Absolutely. She didn't die there. She died in the hospital. But she'd only died like 10 years earlier, too. It was like not a super long time ago thing. So, But it was when my cousin validated it that everything was like, oh, shit, I guess ghosts are real because I think I've seen one now. One, you know? Mary McBride maybe just wanted to go home. And she was like, I'm not dead. I'm just going home. But, dude, why the stairs? That's like, I don't know. You saw her on the stairs. Your cousin saw her on the stairs. What, 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 what? Because that's where you come home. That's how you, you get home. You walk up the stairs, right? That's how you enter the house. Well, yeah. You know what I should ask home. though is I should ask her if she ever saw her or experienced her on the main level. Because mm -hmm. at that point she did. Oh, I was listening right now. Okay. So she did experience her in the kitchen. So I was going to say maybe if she's buried, she's below ground anyway. I don't know. But apparently she's. She was throughout, but man, no, when her, when I said that to her cousin and she just said it like straight up, there wasn't like hesitation there. Like I probably got more pale when I, when she said the lady on the stairs than I did when I actually experienced it. Cause it was so fleeting, you know? Well, yeah. Cause you walk and you're just like, oh, a trick of the eyes, just something in my peripherals. You're not yeah. thinking, dude. And yeah, it, you just kind of put it off like, oh, whatever. But to have it confirmed, that's when you get the chills, the unholy that's vibe, you if you chills. will. For sure. It's a, it was definitely an unholy vibe. It was like, what? Because I'd even, when I said it to her too, I was even half joking. But her response made it not a joke at You're all. You're like, anymore. this is not fun anymore. <laughs> it made it very real. But like I say, she's pretty connected. She feels a lot. She sees a lot. She's very, she's very much like an empath. 
And I think because of that, she's a lot more open to some of the stuff going around her that we don't see, that we don't experience. I think some people are gifted or cursed with that, and some people aren't. I'm not. I'm very, I'm fascinated by all of this stuff. I don't have many experiences to speak of, spiritually spooky things, you know what I mean? And that's why, I, I don't know, that's why I love going and finding other people's. And I have a buddy, he is very sensitive to spiritual things. He sees these things, but he doesn't even think about it. He's just like, yeah, it's whatever. I'm like, bro, that's terrifying. And he even told me, he said, you remember my spooky stories more than I do because I just don't even think about it. I'm like, damn, bro, must be nice or something. But at the same time, I don't think I would want to be plagued with that kind of sensitivity to be on a different wavelength and just be aware of what's i don't know i don't know i'm pretty content where i'm you never know i could say when that one happened i was in a complete headspace of skepticism for ghosts specifically yeah complete headspace of skepticism so it was like and uh, i remember walking in my wife looking at me and seriously just going what's wrong what's the matter because she said i was like really like white and like pale because it was just so shocking because i would have put a thousand dollars that i just seen her walking up the stairs out of the corner of my eye did you notice any details that made you think it was your wife or was it just woman on stairs because again peripherals okay just like a woman on the stairs and and ha- again had i not had the conversation with my cousin and this was probably four to six months after I would have completely written it off as being just, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. DC thinks. Yeah. Has your wife or any of your kids had any weird experiences in any of the places you've been? Lots. (laughs) Well, spill it, buddy. My wife has done a lot. It would probably be better to talk to her, but. She'll have to have her own episode. She might. You might need to talk to her. She has a lot. One of the places that comes to mind immediately for me, and it wasn't really seeing anything, but it was a feeling. And if you know my wife, you'd be like, what? So we went to this place called Devil's Garden. Mm. It's down in Southern Utah, near Lower Calf Creek Falls. I can't remember what the town is right there. I can't remember what it's called. But there's like a couple of like slot canyons in there and stuff. And they're actually called Spooky Canyon and Spooky. And what was the other one called? And Peekaboo. So I don't know. Anyway. So we went to this thing called Devil's Garden. It's just a bunch of random rock structures that are literally around nothing else. And for Native Americans, I think it was a spiritual place. And she like started crying. Something struck her there. And she's not a crier either. She's like very, very few. I probably haven't seen her cry a dozen times in 16 years of marriage. Mm. And she's like, I don't know what I'm feeling here, but there's like some energy. But then she's like, I'll only touch briefly because you really should talk to her at some point. But. She's seen a monk several times in different places. So I don't know if there's some monk astral projecting to her for some reason. She's seen like a dark entity at some point. So she's seen, okay. I thought, I thought you meant like she's gone to see a monk. No, no, no. I'm sorry. No, like saw like a monk that it was definitely there and then gone. That's creepier. Okay. Same one though, in several different places. Yeah. No, she, no, she, we have not visited a month. So that'd be definitely something to talk to her about. It's, she has several stories and they started to happen more when we were on the road and then they've trailed off a little bit. So she hasn't had as many since we quit doing like the whole RV thing. Mm. Um, but when we were out on the road and we were in a lot of places, obviously the American Southwest has a lot of Native American history in it. It has a lot of stories, a lot of spirituality, a lot of, Mm -hmm. you know, just all that kind of stuff that seems to invite a little more of a spiritual or a supernatural or whatever vibe you want to call it. Absolutely. Definitely. She's definitely had some. My kids, I don't know. I think my daughter has, but I don't think my sons have. You never know. So I I talked to someone recently. But we're open to it too. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to someone recently where their kids had seen some really scary stuff. And not just one, two or three of their older kids saw like a gruesome kind of figure walking through the house. And mm-hmm. yeah, dude, I'm going to have the mom on eventually. But she told me like a quick, like little snapshot of her stories. And I was like, oh, that's terrifying. So like really, really gruesome stuff. But no, if Beth wants to come on 
and do an know. episode sometime. I'm more than happy to have her if she wants to come on because I love it. I love hearing all the stories that people have. Yeah, she likely would. Yeah, the only thing I ever had happen with my daughter that was scary, and I still to this day don't know what happened. She was probably two or three. And in the middle of the night, she just screamed, blood curling out of nowhere. I don't even remember getting out of bed. I remember her scream hit and I was on my feet and like running to her room because mm -hmm. I thought she was hurt. She's like, there's a man in the corner. There's a man in my room. No, I'm like thanks. looking around, the lights are on. I'm like, I, I don't know if she had a bad dream. I don't know if she did see something. But it happened one night, never happened again. Dude, kids are creepy. Let's just get that out of the way. They're just open, you know? They're open. Like, yeah, they're, they're... Like you are saying before, like if you believe things, and you're even if you don't believe, but you're open to possibility, then stuff kind of happens that maybe you don't expect. Because I've always been open to possibility, except for the ghosts, dude. I was, like, say I was done with ghosts. I was like, these ghost hunter shows are so damn stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. just done with it. But we're open to a lot of other stuff. Well, I think kids are untainted by anything they're just innocent kids and so that's what makes it worse for me because i'm like they have no preconceived anything they just say there's a scary man in the corner and you go mm -hmm. well just gonna think about that for a while yeah you just reminded me of another one dude i i must have more of these than i realized we, we actually we we lived in utah over the summer not far probably from where you're at we were in in midvale and the house that we lived in, it was built over, a, this is so contrite, but it's true. It was built over an old burial ground. Of course it was. Of course it was. They even have a park there, like this little park that's like a, and they probably had to do it to be able to build the subdivision, right? Because it was a cemetery and it's like a memorial for the people who had been buried. And there's a couple weird stories from there too with my sons, so. A yeah. Building on a burial ground is literally never a good idea. It never goes well. Just the worst, right? No. Oh. And the neighbors in the neighborhood next to us, that neighborhood was, was older, and they said that they saw them like while they were excavating. They were extracting caskets and stuff. I don't like that. But shoot. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's easy to look up, too. This one's too easy to be like, yep, yeah, it definitely was. Like, there's not... Like there's news articles about it and you can see it on old city maps and stuff. Like it's not even a, not even a question. It's Has like, no one yeah, ever seen like Poltergeist? I, I think it was Pioneer. Seriously, or Pet Cemetery. Or, yeah. Or, Literally any movie from the yeah. 80s that's scary and involves graves. Real. Yeah, come on. Jeez. Well, dude, thanks for your story. Do you want to throw out any others or are we going to save yeah, them no. for another time? What are we doing? I don't really have any others that are personal. I have to get my wife on for more so th those are the ones that i experienced and that really were definitely changed my beliefs and my perceptions for absolutely. sure absolutely yeah well shoot dude i appreciate you coming on and recording with me especially so short notice yeah definitely squeezing me in between your oh, your travels tell the people if you want anyone to go follow your guys's instagram yeah our instagram and youtube is the traveling teeps fam you can just search teeps fam and we'll pop up and we just post a lot of travel content there and yeah, stuff like that. So good times. Yeah. I'll be sure to post some links to it in the description and everything. But yeah. This has been great, Lance. I appreciate you. And maybe after you hey, guys are back from Europe, me and Beth can connect and record and she can tell me her stories because I just want more. She's got a lot, man, for sure. So. Okay. Shoot, man. Thanks again. Enjoy your travels. We'll connect. Everyone, be sure to follow them, give them a look, give them a watch, and stay spooky. If you or anyone you know has any spooky stories, reach out to me at unholyvibespod on Instagram, or you can email me at unholyvibespod at gmail.com. Refer anyone to me. Come on, tell your stories. It's a super chill time. You don't need to be nervous. We're just chilling. We're having a conversation. Thank you all for listening. Stay spooky and we'll see you next time.